Hi, everyone, and welcome to this session. My name is Jillian from the Seesaw team, and we are thrilled to have you join us today for successful student-led conferences using digital portfolios in Seesaw with our presenter, Kristen Lazat. During this ses session, we encourage you to take some notes, share insights, and be active while learning. Remember, you do get points on the leaderboard for being active during the sessions. On the top right corner of your screen, you will see the chat. Um, this can be used for sharing ideas and connecting with your other educators today. Next to it is the Q&A for asking questions that will be specific to the presentation. Um, and feel free to ask the questions anytime throughout the session. We will answer them at the end if time allows. There's also a tab labeled handouts. Um, this is where you'll find any session resources um, that will be referenced. And if you like closed captions, please select the CC in the top right corner and choose your preferred language. Please be sure to stick around until the end of the session to earn your PD certificate and for the Seesaw Gear Gift Card giveaway. Now um, it is time for the session. So we will go ahead and jump in. Please welcome Kristen Lazat. I will go ahead and pass it over. Okay, thank you. Hello, I am Kristen Lazat, and I would like to first apologize for the lack of camera because we've drawn a lot of troubleshooting but can't figure, seem to figure out why the camera on my computer will not um, work. So I'm just going to have to hear my voice, I guess. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so thanks for coming to this session today. Um, I have been a teacher for 31 years. A long time. I've taught first, second, and third grade, and most recently, the past three years, I have been teaching third grade. One thing not on this bio slide is that I had the amazing privilege in the year 2019-2020 um, to be awarded the Krista McAuliffe Sabbatical Grant, which is administered by the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation to uh, one New Hampshire educator each year to basically pursue a passion project. Now, while my project um, was centered around project-based learning, as you may know, it is a very student-centered instructional strategy. And as I was learning about project-based learning, I also started to learn more about how to involve students in their assessment. So I, my research also led me to learning more about student-centered assessment and then student-led conferences. And I thought, I really would like to give that a try. But my sabbatical was in 2019, 2020. And then the following year, 2021, we all know what happened. We don't even need to mention it. But I waited until the following year um, after the pandemic restrictions, I guess, sort of died down a little bit. And I was teaching third grade, so a new grade level for me and a new school. And I said, I'm just going to jump right in. So I'm hoping that the research I've done and my experience can help you jump in and, and take a chance on that journey to start um, student-led conferences. So enough about me. Let's get started. Okay, so the targets for today. I'd like to go over the what and the why of student-led conferences some steps in preparing for a student-led conference, some samples, both from um, my classroom and some student work examples, and then resources to learn more, which I think is really important as you start this journey. But before we begin, I wanna do a little poll and ask you, have you ever conducted student-led conferences? Yes or no, and you're excited to learn more. So you'll see a poll pop up, and if you could just pick one of those choices, that would be great. Okay, so it looks, oops, I'll write it. Um, there it is, sorry, <laughs> lost my screen for a minute. Okay, so it looks about a little less than half of you have done student-led conferences before, which is great, and then a lot of you are excited to learn more, which is also great. So hopefully everyone can pick up something that they can use when they start their school year. Okay, so I have one more question for you. How would you base, how would you rate your knowledge base? One, you've heard of student-led conferences, but you don't really know much else, or five, you could pretty much conduct one tomorrow. Okay, and there it is. So if you could just pick a number between one and five, please.
just wait a couple more minutes to give everyone a chance to complete the poll. Wow, so it seems like there's quite a broad range of knowledge. So again, I hope that something today, you can take something back and use it in your own classroom. Okay, so I'd like to start off with the why. So you're here to learn more about student-led conferences, and I was just wondering why. why. Why do you think they would be important or beneficial? Why would you want to take time? Because they do take some time. Why would you want to take time to do that? If you could just either think about it or drop something in the chat saying your why, that would be great. Just give you a minute to, to get that in. Okay, so we have some people who have done it as a parent, but not as a teacher. All right, and a lot of some people had some good success, which is great. Okay, student taking more responsibility for their work, ownership, engagement, yes, all of those things. So as you, many of you mentioned, this does allow for students to take responsibility for their work. They're accountable to their family. This is really important. They're knowing their strengths and challenges. This just goes beyond, well, I did a good job. I did a bad job. My teacher said I did a good job. They have to actually present to their family and know how they're doing. And then it gives them a lot of voice and choice in the learning process, which I really think is a sign of respect for our students. And it's also high expectations. It's saying, you know, you can do this. You can be responsible for your learning and you can show your, your families. So all of these things, choosing, reflecting the pieces really encourages that. So some other benefits, building student engagement, responsibility, organization. You really need to have an organized plan to present your, your work. You become more engaged in the learning process. If you know that you're going to have to show this to your family, it may encourage you to just get a little bit more involved in, in what you're doing. The next one I think is a really big one, creating that culture of evidence. So again, sometimes we tell students, oh, you did a great job, or they think they didn't do such a good job. But this is actually, yes, I did a good job. Look, this is how I know. This is actually the evidence that I have. So it's that culture in your classroom. It actually starts to change. I know it changed my teaching uh, because students are really encouraged to reflect not only during the conference, but also as they are learning, it just sort of became something that they did. So, and I think that's really important. And then strengthening home school partnerships. I have had pretty much 100% parent participation. I had a colleague say, oh, did so-and-so's parent come to the conference? And I said, yes. And I know the reason why is probably because the child, I think they may have nagged their parent a little bit because they asked me several times, when is my conference again? What time? And they wrote down a little note and made sure that their parent showed up. So I think that is just really important that we involve parents that way. And then, then this is, it, it's a whole team, family, student, and then teacher. Now, when I was reading about student-led conferences, I mean, there are lots of different ways to do it, depending on your grade level, your population, wherever you are, but there are some best practices that rise to the top. So before we dive into the particulars of a conference, I'd like to talk about some of those. So a portfolio, and this is more than just, let's collect some work and just like at an open house and show parents. This is reflection. Student reflection is an essential piece of the portfolio. They have to be able to think about their work and how they did. And then a protocol for the conference. This just makes it go much more smoothly. It gives the conference a focus. And then for those students who maybe are a little shy, give some guidance on what they need to do. And for those students who really want to say everything, maybe reins them in a little bit. And then there are opportunities throughout this whole process, really, for feedback from families and teachers. So during the conference, the families are definitely giving feedback, contributing to the goal setting, which is that final stage. And then as the, um, the portfolio process is going on with students choosing pieces, there's also a lot of feedback from the teacher as student and teachers um, meet. And I think that the goals are a lot more meaningful when the students are part of the process. And I've seen that in my class where our students, we set the goal and they were part of setting that goal and then they notice it later. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we go on. Okay, so I think this is really essential. Preparation is absolutely key. Students not only need time to choose their pieces, but they need time to practice before the conference, to build confidence and to make them 
more likely that the conference will be successful. The use of agendas, scripts, sentence stems. This is once again connected to protocols, which was on an earlier slide. If, like I said, if a student's shy, if this is a new experience for them, they have sort of like an anchor. They have a script, they have an agenda, they know what's going to happen next. So they can rely on that if they're starting to feel nervous. And again, if students really want to say everything, this sort of reins them in a little bit again. And now this is also important. Teachers and students should be really clear about which standards and learning targets will be represented, both in student work and at the conference. I think the specificity is just so important, both in your planning, when you're planning the student conference, planning how portfolios will be assembled, and then in student work choice. They need this that focus so that they know their, what their pieces are actually giving evidence of. Okay, so now preparing for the student-led conference. How does it actually get done? And I'm going to ask you just to take a minute here to visualize for you what you would imagine if in a, a conference went exactly how you wanted it to go. What would that look like? At the end of the conference, what would be the outcome? What do you want families to walk away with knowing? Um, what would you want your, what would your students need to get there? What would they need to do? And then what would you want families to really be seeing and learning about? So if you could take just a couple of minutes, jot it down, you can put it in the chat, you can just think about it. How would you want that student-led conference to go? I think it would be helpful for you to just have that in your mind before we go forward. I'll give you a couple of minutes. Okay, so hopefully you have, I know that wasn't enough time, but hopefully you have just a little bit of an idea of what, when those fam, when the parents walk away, what, what information will they know? Okay, so here we are, step one, getting started. Again, what do you want to convey families at the conference? And when I started, this was exactly how I started. I thought, well, what do I usually say when I'm in a, in a parent-teacher conference? And now how can I sort of shift that instead of me being with the parents and the kids playing Legos in the corner, how can I involve them? Because really, when you think about it, they always wonder what we're saying and why should it be a secret? That, that's how, what really got me motivated because I think that they're part of this. This is all about them and I really think they should be a part of the conversation. So um, I've used a lot of different ways to convey the information, whether it's a test or an assignment or a project reflection. Um, checklists, rubrics, there are just so many things that you can use for evidence. Now, when I also, when I first started, I waited till the end of the quarter and then I took a learning block from each subject area. So each one day for the, a week at the end of the quarter, I spent one subject area block dedicated to this. So I had the students um, choose their pieces. I made the learning goals that we've been working on clear, but I realized that that was just a lot to put at the end of the quarter. So what I eventually, what I do now is as we're doing the learning at the end of a project, at the end of a math unit, I will stop there and do the, the choose the pieces, choose the reflection, uh, start the reflection and all of that will happen as the learning is happening. It seems like it's a lot more natural and it makes a lot more sense. And then students, it's really more fresh in their mind. So I have found that that has been a more successful strategy for me. So I want to show you some examples of what I'm talking about. So this is something I do as we're, so, so this was at the end of a project we did in science and I had science and informational text goals. So this is actually an example of a paper I gave. So I gave this paper to each student and we went over it, the things that we had been working on and they, this wasn't new to them. We had been talking about this. And I said that you need to pick something. It doesn't have to be every single learning goal, but maybe pick three that work you've done can give evidence that you've mastered this or it's something that you need to work on. So they had time to look this over. We talked about it, asked questions. And then here's one student. She chose a model she made of a organism meeting its survival needs. And then this is a little research she did on something in the habitat. And then she also chose this, which we had 
during the project, the students had come up with a bunch of questions and we categorized them and each we had research teams and each research team did reading and research and then they had to create something that they could present to the class to teach about their assigned research questions. So this is what the student chose and she took pictures and put them into Seesaw. So it doesn't have to be everything online because as if you've used Seesaw before, you know that you, offline things can, you can just take a picture and put it right in. So these are the pieces she chose. And at the end, so she had that paper I showed you at the beginning as sort of her anchor, but these are the things she said she could do and what she still wanted to work on. She really wanted to grow her vocabulary. So that was one of her goals. And then just here's another example. Um, this is some narrative writing that we did. And you can see what and we use rubrics with narrative writing, but this is what she thought she could do and what she, she wanted to use more transitions. Now I have to say this particular child, I remember because into the second quarter, when we did another writing project, it wasn't even narrative. And she said, oh, right, I'm working on transitions. So what, you know, we worked together. She asked me for a little bit of help of how she could have more transitions in her writing. So she was part of that goal set that we set at the conference with her family and herself and me. And then she remembered the goal and she actually later on wanted to, to, to work on it. And sometimes I create assignments. So this is something I created in Seesaw so students can reflect on their work habits. And I'll just advance this and show you on what this student chose to do. And you can just take a look. And then something there. And then at the end, I do ask them to come up with their own goal. So she wanted to get better at hands down conversations, which she participated a lot, but she she was a, a child who liked structure and she liked to raise her hand and get called on and have it sort of go that way. So hands down conversations were when we would have class conversations, but it was in, in, in an actual conversation where they didn't have to raise their hand and it was really hard for her to put her voice and she actually told me she really didn't like them, but she wanted to get better at it. Now you may be wondering, well, what about those students who maybe aren't quite so accurate? And that happens, reflecting on what you can do and can't do isn't always easy, especially for children. This is just, I consider this, it's like a learning process, like anything else. So before we have the portfolio and call it done, I actually have an individual meeting with one-on-one with, -on -one with the students. And if they have something that either maybe isn't quite accurate or something I want their parents to know that maybe they don't agree with this being a goal. I would, I might, I have actually written Mrs. Lazat says, and I've written my goal. So I think that's still part of, can be part of the process. Also, I've also offered them evidence. So just as they offer evidence of what they can do, if someone is maybe not quite accurate about maybe their behavior or something, I will say, well, let's, you know, think about it. We, we go together through their behavior or through their academics and they usually can see what I'm talking about. Um, if they've had maybe some kind of misconception. Again, going back to that evidence is really important. All right, so now we can move on. Step two, preparing the portfolio pieces, which we've talked about a little bit, but all of the work, and I'm going to show this in a little bit, but all of the work is placed, I create a portfolio folder in Seesaw, and then they put all of their work into that folder. So I set that part up for them, but they choose all of the pieces. So again, once they have those learning goals that are explicit, they use those to help them choose the evidence. They choose their own pieces. Sometimes I suggest pieces, but really ultimately it's up to them as long as they're meeting that goal of showing evidence for their learning and their struggles. And then students reflect on their learning, which you saw some examples of just a few minutes ago. And then they identify uh, learning targets they've mastered and then things they still need to work on. So here's an example of a rubric I've used in writing with informative writing. It's actually from EL Education, which is cited at the bottom there. So when they write a piece, this is something that I'll use to give them feedback and that they can use to reflect on their own learning. So if they choose this piece, the reflection sort is already done. They'll just have to think about how to talk about it because the nature of the rubric, it just 
it lends itself to having the evidence right there. So this might be a good piece for them to pick without having to do extra reflection. It's, it's sort of already there. Now, this is an example of a reflection that I've had. I, sometimes I include the reflection right on like a math. This is a math assessment on regrouping and rounding. So number sense and operations. I think that's what this one was. And then the student reflects. So I do this a bunch of different ways. Sometimes I'll give a test and have them reflect right away. But that, that can be hard because it's sometimes it's hard to know what you know and what you don't know. Sometimes I will... In, I'll use Seesaw and I will give them feedback either through all the tools that Seesaw has through videos, through talking, through comments, um, things like that. So at the end of the math test, they can look at my feedback and then I'll have them do the reflection. And then really, I think what's best, but it's really time consuming. So I can't always do it. I choose this wisely, but sometimes I will actually sit with them and go through the math test. And so they can actually see what the feedback means, because I think that's one of my ongoing goals is to have students be more responsible and and take more responsibility for feedback and then acting on it. But again, I teach third grade, so that isn't always easy. So again, that one on one conversation, I really find the best, but I use I just choose when the best times to, to do that would be because, like I said, I don't always have time to do all of that. And also, it's not always not easy um, for students to do it. So again, it's a learning process. Another reason when they pick a math test to go over it before the conference is that sometimes they, I've had students actually in conferences want to go over every single question, even though before the conference we will go, well, well, this is what we're trying to show evidence of. So which piece, which part of this can you show them instead of, because that can take a really long time in the conference and we don't want to spend the conference going over every single question. So that's another challenge that comes up um, that we need to work on. And now sometimes, and I, I let them do this because again, I really want to give them voice and choice as long as they are meeting the goal of giving evidence for their learning. So sometimes I've had students just create their own evidence. I've had students make videos showing that they can multiply. And this student here decided that he would, he just said, I don't want to use my math test. I'm just going to prove that I can do the algorithm and I understand multiplication and division. And they decided to just, you can see that's a whiteboard and then they added some text. So they added, they, this is all them. They proved that they could do these things. Okay, so this, this also went to the portfolio. So again, it really can be a wide variety of assignments. All right, and then the next step is assembling and creating the portfolio in Seesaw. So work, like I said before, is placed in that portfolio folder in Seesaw to build that body of evidence. And again, it can be assignments that are already in Seesaw. It can be photos of work that can be uploaded into Seesaw. That's, that's the thing I love about Seesaw. It can really be used for so many ways for, to, for students to show their learning. And just a really simple tutorial. At the bottom, there's that of, of any assignment they create in Seesaw is that little folder. So they click on the folder. And then, like I said, I already have the portfolio all set up to go. And they just click on that. And then there it is. And you can see at the bottom of the assignment, it will show you if you use Seesaw, you probably know how you can how you can see which folder it's in. And then portfolio shows up and they can see it and I can see it and we can all make sure that it's where it belongs. And then what they can do is go to, um, if they go to, when they go to their journal, if they click on the folder icon, they can just click on portfolio. And what will happen is the only work that will show up is all of the work in their portfolio. And then when you have the student-led conference, there it is. They don't have to go searching for it. Okay. The final step, students, well, I guess before presenting, the next to final step is students practice presenting their portfolio. So some things that help with this, the teachers, I've done this, we create a script for the conference. I'll show you an example of that on the next slide. And then students practice presenting their portfolio and they get feedback. So here's an example of a script that my class and I created. It's pretty straightforward, but it, it just gives them that guideline. And depending on the student, I've also given them sentence stems like this shows I can, or look at this math piece. Now I, specific to their own portfolio if they need it. 
And then I've been, I'm fortunate I have a paraprofessional in my classroom part-time. So I think I mentioned this before. So first the student and I go over the whole portfolio. We talk about it. They, they tell me what they want, what each piece shows. I give my feedback. Once we're all set, I've had my paraprofessional pretend to be one of their family members and they go somewhere quiet and they actually go through the conference just as if it, they were presenting it to their family. And then the para can tell me, well, this one, you know, he, he still needs a little bit more practice. Um, they're all set. So things like that. So I, we definitely do a whole run through, a whole dress rehearsal before conference night. And then finally is the conference. My favorite part. They present their work to their family and I am there to support, but I literally sit behind the student with their family. And then I take a back seat, the student leads and parents are given the opportunity to ask questions, give feedback. And it doesn't always go perfectly. I've had one little child one year, he just sat silently and he wouldn't say anything. And I had to just, I just basically, we went through the pieces and I asked questions and he did, he did answer my questions fortunately. And he was able to go through his work and where some of that reflection was in writing already, his mother could actually read it. So he didn't have to say too much because he was extremely uncomfortable. And then I've had the other extreme where students want to just show every single thing. And I've had to sort of guide them that way too. So really it depends that it, this is, like I said, a learning process. The students are learning how to do this. And either way, their families I've seen have been just really pleased to have, have their child be the one presenting their work. And the questions they ask have been great. And watching the students answer that um, is also wonderful. The, the pride that most of them show in their work. And you know, it's, it's more than just, this is what I did, but look, we'll look at what I'm learning. I feel like it's shifted that um, conversation a little bit. Okay. Now, oh, I, I do want to mention, I put that at the bottom. Um, I do allow time for parents to talk to me privately if they want to. And sometimes I request that we talk privately, depending on if there's a certain kind of issue that really wouldn't be appropriate to talk about in front of the child. So I always leave a little bit of time at the end for that. It doesn't happen very often, honestly, because usually students, like if they have IEPs, 504s, you have separate meetings for those anyway. So this can really be just about the student's progress in the classroom. Now, I'm not going to show you this video now, but there, I will show you in just a minute. There is a link to it. I think that it's really helpful to watch student-led conferences in all of the different um, grade levels. So if I can just show you here. So this is the list of resources. And I really encourage you to look at them because I find for me, that was really helpful to be able to watch videos and read more about it. So the first one here is an, a page in Ed Utopia of all about student-led conferences. And at the bottom there, that link you just saw, there are a bunch of links that you can watch um, different grade level conferences. And then the second link is EL Education. There's a book called Leaders of Their Own Learning, which I have read and it's outstanding. It's about student-led assessment, not just student-led conferences, but they do have a, a chapter about it. So if you don't wanna buy the book, you can go to this web, to the EL Education, this link, this website, and they have, they call them PD packs. So each chapter has a little summary. And I think it would be really useful. Even if you don't read the book, you can get the gist of what the chapter is about. And they include videos and really great information. So the first link is just the chapter about student-led conferences. And then the second link is the entire, the, for each chapter of the book. And then just the rest of the links are all different resources to just read more about student-led conferences. This last link here, this Prezi, is a Prezi I made about student-centered assessment. Like I had mentioned, I had that sabbatical year, and one of the things I did was create a website. And this is some of the information. It's a lot of the links that I've showed you about, but it just has a bunch of different information about student-centered assessment. Okay, so thank you so much for attending this presentation. And I am wondering what you're still wondering. So I think now we have a, a Q&A time. Do we have time for that? Yes, we do. Wonderful. Thank you so much for going through that presentation with us. I know I learned a lot and especially loved a lot of the connections that you made with the students showing evidence to their own family um, and that relationship. Um, we got several questions okay. um, in the, the chat and in the Q&A. So um, 
we will run through some of these. One that came up quite frequently was um, about how much time do you set aside for each of the student-led conferences? I set aside 30 minutes, which I know if you have a big class can be challenging. And I, ne I never use, well, not never. It doesn't usually, <laughs> it usually takes about 20, but I like to give 30 just so I don't have <laughs> any, any worries about time. Great. Yes, I the time does fly by during those <laughs> those conferences. And depending on how detailed students are, it can be longer or shorter. Absolutely. Um, we did get another question from Nicole. What is the youngest and oldest student-led conferences you have done? Like which grade levels? So I have only done student-led conferences in third grade. That's when I started um, doing it. So I've been doing them for three years only. And every year I learn more. There is a video on, I think it's the EL Education website, where a kindergartner is giving a, doing a student-led conference with her grown-ups. It's really, it's really fun to watch. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we also have a question from Lucy. Do you have conferences beginning of the year and end of the year, or how frequently do you usually have them? That's a really good question. I wish we had more, but we only do conferences the first quarter. We, we do quarters and we only do it the first quarter. So what I've actually done is had them create portfolios every quarter, except for the last one, because they can't have their computers after that. But I've done, they've done portfolios, we've done the practice and everything, and they just do it at home. And I, if I have, I mean, I have as needed, I do call in students to do that and I'll involve them, but we are, as far as formally, we only have a one conference a year, which is unfortunate. All right. Thank you so much for that. We have a question from Alicia. How long do the one-to-one -one conversations usually take to help them learn to assess themselves? Does it get faster as the year goes on and they learn and um, grow the confidence there? Yes, it does go faster as the year goes on. Um, some students, so some students are just really, really good at reflecting and knowing themselves, and those tend to be maybe five or ten minutes. But students who where this is really hard, it can take maybe fifteen or twenty. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, you're right. I do notice that they get better as the year goes on because they're, like I think I mentioned in the presentation, this actually has changed my teaching because not only am I thinking. Thinking, oh, we'll have to do a portfolio at the end of the quarter. But as we are learning, it's not just about the portfolio and the conference. It's about the, do you understand what we're doing right now? Have you mastered this skill that we're working on? Like for math, for example, I've had a student say, oh, I didn't get this and now I do. So I might say, oh, how did you know that? Well, look. And, and so they're, they're getting used to showing evidence. So it's actually changed my teaching and saying, it, putting it on them and saying, well, how are you going to show me? How are you going to show evidence of these learning targets that you've met or not met? And what are we going to keep working on? So it's gone really beyond just being ready for a conference, but just sort of changing the culture of the classroom that this is on you too, not just me. Definitely the ownership piece. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Makes a lot of sense. Um, we're also getting several questions about um, age and grade levels. So mm -hmm. I know you mentioned um, doing this with your third graders. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth is wondering, do you see this working with younger students? Um, they have Seesaw for K through second. And then we mm -hmm. also have Antoinette um, that was trying to wrap her head around simplifying this for pre-K. So um, even younger, mm -hmm. to hear your thoughts. Right. Well, I've, I've taught first grade and I'm not done student-led conferences in first grade, but I can definitely see doing this. It would, of course, it would look different, I think, if you did it with younger kids. Um, sorry, I'm just thinking. Of course. I mean, just the, the way that they understand their learning is a little bit different, and the, what you can say to them, I think, is a little bit different, too. Developmentally, they're not as, like, third graders and first graders are very different students. But I would encourage you to watch the videos, because I think it shows like the kindergarten video, they sing a little song that they always do at their welcome. And then she just says what she's proud of. And then she reads a little book. So I think there are ways, I think in kindergarten, even preschool, it's probably more affirming, look what I can do. And I think that they, they just don't have the metacognition yet to say, well, I'm really good at this and I'm working on this, but, but I think it, it affirms what they are learning and what they can do. So maybe that's how it would look different with the younger grades. But I, st I still think they're capable of doing it. Like I said, it just looked different. Sure, sure, makes sense. Um, we have a, a question from um, Kristen. Would you ever consider holding a whole class student-led portfolio? 
Sorry, you blipped out on the last part of that question. Oh, sorry. Would you ever consider holding whole class student led portfolio conferences? I saw that in one of the resources that I read. Um, I guess the thing that I, I've seen that, like I said, that's an approach, but I think I prefer to do it one on one just because I like to it to be sort of centered around the student. I like to, I guess, it's partly me. I like to, oh, to see what's happening and I want to be really part of that goal setting too. Um, so that I can see the process that happened before they got there and what their parents think about it, like the, the feedback from the family. And I wouldn't want to miss out on that. And it might be harder in a whole class setting, but that would be more efficient as far as timing. Actually, that's probably a good idea too for maybe second quarter, just invite families in and, and do that if they've been through it once. But I do prefer though, I would think I would prefer the one-on-one. -on -one. All right. Very good. Well, thank you so, so much. Um, thank you to the audience for attending. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed the session today. Uh, your PD certificate will be emailed to you and all of the Connect session recordings will be available on demand starting August 4th. Um, if you have some time, um, we hope that you can please visit the networking tab to chat with other educators from around the world and earn those points for the leaderboard. The top 50 people will win prizes. Mm -hmm. um, and during our closing session today, there will be some more opportunities for giveaways. Now it is time for our prizes. We're going to do a giveaway and choose two winners at random to win some Seesaw gear um, by earning some Seesaw store gift cards. So I will go ahead and start the giveaway. We'll spin the wheel. <laughs> All right, the winners are Patty and Tammy. Congratulations. Yes, <laughs> congratulations to the winners. We will email you next week um, as a follow-up with instructions to claim those prizes. And as we close our session, just to note that a survey will automatically appear on your screen. It consists of just one question, and we very much appreciate the feedback from our audience if you have a moment to spare before heading to your next session. Thank you again for joining us, and big thank you to Kristen for the wonderful presentation today. Of course. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Bye, everyone.